Welcome into the PFF NFL Podcast. Steve Palazzolo here with John Dorsey. Is that John? John, is that you with your Cleveland Brown sweatshirt? I had to. I, I had to represent our team clients. Obviously, we have all thirty-two teams, but I had to support, show my support with the uh, Dorsey sweater here today. And so it's really the Bachelorette's own Mike Renner here. But you got the Dorsey sweater sweatshirt, mm-hmm. and um, it's a real fresh sweatshirt. Like it's for as it's really good for as old and probably out of touch with fashion as John Dorsey is. He pulled. It's a fantastic design that he came up with. I do kind of wear every single day. One of those, like the nineteen eighty one. Cleveland Browns, just white sweatshirt with just block, block orange lettering. Cleveland Browns lettering. I love it. And I mean, they are the, this was, this was it. This was the plan all along was for this Sashi. to happen. For, Sashi it, let yeah, this, this happen. Was, I mean, this was what the, what they had in mind was you're going to suck for a few years. That's what's going to happen. But you're going to have so much cap space and so many draft picks that there's going to come a time where you can strike while the iron's hot, so to speak, and make your run. Make your run in a championship. They got the quarterback. They have a ridiculous roster now offensively. Well, it's yet to be played on the football field, so but on paper, so everything that's why you're wearing your, your Browns so I'm all, yeah. sweatshirt. Like I said, I'm supporting team client. All right, guys, we've got the, a full podcast here. Um, it's a bonus podcast. Let me just set the set, set the table here. Mm-hmm. First off, I think because we're going to separate a lot of these into YouTube videos, a lot of people are going to be confused buy your brown sweatshirt and think that you're very biased and oh, we're talking yeah. about the Jets and the Giants and all that stuff but That's we'll just fortunate we'll just let it slide right now as you said the Browns are a team client you can represent them with the um, you can rep- represent our clients yeah. as much as you would like um, here's what we're gonna do it's a bonus podcast this is a special to all of our loyal listeners here during draft and free agency season we'll still have another one later in the week where Sam Monson and I will break down just kind of recap free agency but what I want to do today is talk draft with you, Mike, and what how free agency has affected all this stuff. Yes, hybrid podcast here. Obviously, every single mock draft just went out the window. Trades, signings that completely filled needs where teams aren't going to go there anymore. So the mock drafts go out the window. We're not going to see the teams that made those moves. Where now this leaves them? What now do they need? What now players should they be targeting? So we're going to go through the teams that were most active, teams and Give our takes on where that should do, you know, come late April. All right. So let's start with the Cleveland Browns. And we've got some breaking news here. Oh, Mike. What this is, is it? real breaking news. Uh-oh. We're not going to start with the Browns. We're going to start with the Baltimore Ravens. Interesting. Landing Earl Thomas. Thank you, Matt. You can have your Ooh. phone back for more breaking news. Here you go. The Ravens, who yeah. lost a ton of defensive talent in free agency, mm-hmm. including Eric Weddle, on the back end, they land... Earl Thomas as their new free safety. The new Ed Reed in Baltimore. Four years, $55 million is the report, which that's less than Landon Collins got. That, you know, That's less per year than what Tyree Matthew got in Kansas City. And if you're objectively evaluating the two over the next three years, which is all the contract Tyree Matthew got, you're taking Earl Thomas 10 times out of 10. So from the Ravens' perspective, that's a win. They've bled a ton of talent defensively. They needed a leader there, lost their leader in secondary. And Eric Weddle lost their leader in the linebacking core. And C.J. Mosley, all of a sudden, Earl Thomas comes in, gives them hope for next season because everyone, everything was trending at this right. offseason. Everything was turning down in the AFC North except for the Browns, who were trending skyrocketing up. They had to keep pace. The champions of that division a year ago, Mar Jackson heading into year two, there's reason to believe Ravens have a chance of repeating. I mean, they lost a lot of talent, but that's still a talented roster, talented defense on the back end. Yeah, we're not completely ready to declare the mm-hmm. – Cleveland Browns as well we were, we've declared him as the favorite over <laughs> at profootballfocus.com but it's not completely locked in stone Earl mm-hmm. Thomas uh, he's going to be 30 years old by the time the season starts he's battled injuries over the last few years but we're still talking about a guy who could put up elite grades in coverage he's a special coverage player he completely changes what the defense can do due to his range and instincts mm-hmm. or mental processing yes. or whatever you want to call it he just knows where the football is going, and he gets there quickly. And he goes to a scheme in Baltimore where they have the strong safety in Tony Jefferson. They have the box guy. He will be right. the free safety. He will right. be the role he's always played. Now, he can do it all. You can play him in the box if you want. But I think the where he can make his most impact is shutting down the seams down the field as a single high safety. So don't write off the Ravens just yet. Uh, I like the signing. Earl Thomas came in as our top free agent on the board. 
uh, despite the age. You know, usually with free agency, we do say, look, if you're up in your 30s, you're not necessarily going to be uh, near the top of the draft, bo- uh, the free agent board, just because of the long term implications. Mm. But even with the injuries and the way he throws his body around, you know, is is this a good enough risk for four years here? I, I still think it is because of of where the uh, potential is. With I was going to say, I, I think what makes him so special is not purely his athleticism. It's sort of like Charles Woodson at the end of his career in Oakland, still making plays. It's his ability to see the game. The special ones age gracefully. So I think over the course of that contract. There's no reason to think he's not going to be one of the best safeties in the NFL. And this pretty much pencils in now Baltimore Ravens, lost Terrell Suggs, lost Darius Smith, lost Derek Weddle, but replaced him with Earl Thomas, lost C.J. Mosley. I think it's pencils in at 22 to somewhere in that front seven or yep. somewhere along the offensive line. No, they're probably not going to go back end, probably not going to be safety or corner there. That's either probably O-line or front seven now with the way that team is built. Absolutely love the way the, the secondary is built in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're, it seems like they've lost a lot but they are still secure in the most important part in the defense, which is the secondary. Dating back to 2013, Earl Thomas coverage grades, including the playoffs, 89.1, 89.1, 90.9, 80.3, and 90.5. Before last year, only 237 snaps, 90.6. So we're talking about elite coverage grades. Is that good? That seems good. Pretty much every year. Yeah, there's not another safety in the NFL that has been, actually probably the one who's been as consistent over that span might be Eric Weddle in terms of just consistently good to great grades every single season. That's Earl Thomas. You know what I'd be interested to see, though? Because Eric Weddle has been put in positions that tap into his versatility, where mm-hmm. Earl Thomas has been in a scheme where he's just the single high free safety, and he does yeah. some other things, too. I want to know if they use him like a Weddle. If they play him in this Raven scheme, where they'll have Weddle yeah. you know, in and around the line of scrimmage and then go back and play center field. They'll have him disguise. Mm-hmm. Teams talked about how much they pre- prepared for Eric Weddle because of how much he did. I want to know if they're just like, hey, Earl, go play center field like, like he's used to. Or if they do tap into his ability to maybe, you know, start on the other side of the field and then work back to free safety. And, yeah. and, and Earl, if when he plays in the box, is also a good player as well. I mean, that's the thing. He can kind of do it all. He just never really has had to. Yeah, the funny thing about the Seattle cover three is that half the NFL is running it now because one team ran it with three future Hall of Famers on their roster. <laughs> right. They could have been running, you know, straight cover two again. They could have brought back the cover two with how talented those players were on the back end put Earl Thomas in basically any role he could be excel so this will definitely be a change from what we've seen from him because they, they don't play just purely cover three they're not a purely single high team he'll definitely be asked to do a lot more coverage wise than he was asked in yeah and the Ravens love to disguise Earl Thomas obviously has the uh the smarts to uh to impact that scheme so Earl Thomas to the Ravens all right great work with the breaking news Matt let's move on back to our regularly scheduled programming which is as we said the Cleveland Browns mm-hmm. and how free agency will impact the draft for them, where they are as a team, as a roster right now. Uh, You mentioned at the very opening of the podcast that, you know, when you have all this draft capital, you can play around with it. It's not all about using the picks, but now they're using the picks first and third and Jabril Peppers to go get Odell Beckham. We have the Kevin Zeitler for Olivier Vernon, essentially straight up trade. I mean, just some power moves here by Mm -hmm. the Cleveland Browns. Yeah, also Sheldon Richardson they added along their defensive line. Uh, the Kareem Hunt move was a little earlier, but also plays a role in this. Obviously, they had to give up a guard to get, you know, they gave up Kevin Zeiler at right guard, gave up Jabril Peppers, a safety, starting safety, let go of Jamie Collins because that contract was bloated compared to his performance. That yeah, one's he not great. huge, uh, a loss for them. So I think it's pretty defined now, their needs. You thought they might have had defensive line. Everyone had them penciled in for Jeffrey Simmons for a while going to the first round. Sheldon Richardson solves that. Maybe an edge rusher, Olivier Vernon solves that. So probably those two positions off the board. Now it's either somewhere on the back end in round two when they finally are up on the clock, cornerback, safety. That's where yeah. their biggest needs are at the moment because offense looks fine. Defense, the back end, the, the secondary is the, where any question marks you could point out on that roster lie right now. Yeah, so I'm all about yeah the safety position or the cornerback position because um, – and this matches up well. We've talked about this before. I think the way college football is trending now, because there's so many spread offenses, there's so many. There's just a big, wide variety of wide receivers, corners, and safeties that are entering the NFL every year. That it ends up loading the second and third rounds with potential talent. Um, plus, the NFL is going to. They always take lesser players a little bit higher um, because the NFL is not perfect. So I always think that there's good corner and safety value in the second and third round. So just using our board as an example, a guy like Julian Love from Notre Dame. Could be available yes. there. Guy like Darnell Savage 
from Maryland could be there mm -hmm. at safety. Uh, Amani Hooker from Iowa. Uh, Juan Thornhill yes, from Virginia. A, Amani Hooker, I feel like, would be perfect for that defense in terms of what he brings to the table. Very similar skill set to Jabril Peppers. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, you can replace that box safety uh, with some coverage ability in the mm -hmm. second round. You can maybe grab one of those corners. Rocky Asin maybe from Temple could be available there. Jamel Dean from Auburn mm -hmm. could be there. So we're just... You know, if you're talking about this um, roster construction for the Browns, I do think the revamp of the defensive line is just fantastic. That has helped already a ton. They've got plenty of weapons for Baker Mayfield. The offensive line is still in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing that they could do is say, we've got Greg Robinson on a one-year deal, and he's Greg Robinson, and we need to upgrade mm -hmm. at tackle. So that's the other place yes. where so maybe one of the you – know, like a Greg Little – who's you know kind of a fringe first round type of player could be available in the second round out of Ole Miss you might try to develop him that's maybe the other way I think the Browns could potentially go but I see them going defense in the secondary yeah defense just to me makes the most sense offensive line I could see but secondary is where the need lies right now but I will not I will not completely take off defensive line off the board for that first sure. pick because what you saw happen last year Miles Garrett Larry Ogunjobi play the most snaps play among the most snaps of any defensive lineman in the NFL the depth there, while you replace two, you know, while you have two more quality starters, the depth behind them still seriously lacking. You need to give those guys breathers. If you're in this for the long term, if you're going to be playing, if you have Super Bowl aspirations, you can't ask those guys, all four starters, to play a thousand snaps and then you know a three game run in the playoffs, a four game run in the playoffs, whatever it may be. So you need to get them breathers. You need to have some talent there to roll in, get a rotation going on that defensive line. Yes, yeah, so definitely a few different options for the Browns, but uh, you know we always discuss the theory of you know you kind of fill your needs in free agency and then you go into the draft hopefully oh, with fewer needs mm -hmm. and you just grab uh, the best players it's not that the Browns are need free but they've 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 secured a lot of their needs in free agency and through these these big trades with the Giants yeah they I mean they did they added about as much talent as you possibly could probably more than anyone else over this course of this free agent period didn't hit every single need but I think they're competent enough at the positions they didn't hit to where They've, they've made no one position a must draft in this upcoming draft. All right, let's move on to the New York Giants. Uh, they have done a lot of things, and I think the big question for the Giants, uh, it's tough to separate what they did last year in the draft from the, the, the moves here, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, yes, yeah. The, the Saquon it Barkley is, at two, it's very difficult to separate it. There was a point where it was week, what, six, seven of last season where they realized – we were wrong. Dave Gettleman, GM, realized we did not have the roster I thought we did. We were not as good as I thought we were. I should not have traded for Alec Ogletree, should not have been drafting a running back second overall. We're not capable of winning right now with this roster. The switch was flipped. They got rid of Damon Harrison, got rid of Eli Apple towards the end of last season, and they have been basically gutting the roster ever since to try and, you know, the, the starting the process, the, you know, the rebuild process that's going to be a few year process. But the thing that still doesn't mesh with that is why is Eli Manning still a quarterback? If this is a three year process, I get that it's, you well, can he cut has him. to be, you haven't had a chance to replace him. I was going to say, you can cut him at any point in the off season, but like if they, I can see passing on this year's group of quarterbacks class in the first round, you have Kyle a letter from a year ago. Hopefully, you know, he develops into year two, but I maybe I can see not being in love. You know, the Browns passed on QBs uh, at the top of the draft before multiple times. I can see doing that. But I just can't see going in with Eli Manning and his cap hit after you gutted the rest of this roster, got rid of good players left and right, and then keeping his cap hit in 2019 would not make sense to me. Well, let's let's see. Does Dave Gettleman have the foresight or the idea yes. that, like, hey, I'm going to be around for the next four or five years mm -hmm. to tank right now? Can Do you tank right? Do you go in with Eli one more year, not necessarily draft a quarterback, with your two first round picks maybe you don't reach for a daniel jones as they've been they've been linked to a daniel daniel jones from duke maybe you don't reach for a drew block a uh, drew lock in yeah. our mind right we're yeah. not gonna necessarily reach for those guys get into the justin herbert to a uh, mix next year mm -hmm. not that anybody's a sure thing but yeah. you know just continue to build the roster over this next year i mean do do they have that type of patience because i think that's going to be the key yes in in isolation the Odell Beckham trade is not the worst thing in the world for the Giants if they're in this rebuild mode, right? Mm -hmm. it's, yes. it's a first-round pick, a third-round pick, plus Jabril Peppers, who just two years ago was a first-round yeah, pick. Yeah, who is about a good-case scenario for a first-round pick. Yeah. So that, that on paper, 
that is probably better than getting a 2019 first and 2020 first in terms of your return. Because if they got 2020 first in the Browns, chances are it's going to be not a great. It's going to be further <laughs> it's down. It's going to be in the twenties. Right. So, so it's not the worst thing in the world in isolation. It's just commit to it. It's just if you, when you have Saquon Barkley last year instead of Sam Darnold, say you know if they if they went Darnold instead, they probably don't trade Odell Beckham. Mm-hmm. He becomes the the key yes. you know weapon for Sam Darnold instead of the key weapon for Baker Mayfield. Mm-hmm. And then you start to build. And you, you can, maybe you do still flip Olivier Vernon for Kevin Zeitler, and you're building yep. the offensive line, and you start to build the offense around Darnold. And there's still a defensive build that you need to create, but you're at least a little bit more encouraged on the offensive side. Yeah, I don't like I said on right now. I don't hate the moves. If I'm a Giants fan, this is your best case scenario: is to be bad in 2019. You want to not be a good team in 2019. If you're going to tank, it behooves you to really tank, to really go back and get that number one overall pick and have your choice of quarterbacks, that sort of thing. But don't now go fill out the back of your roster with free agents. Uh, you know, ruin your compensatory pick that you're going to get from Landon Collins. Don't do that if you're going right. to have this long-term vision. Just let it be bad for a while. Use all this draft capital. Even maybe if you don't think quarterback class is good, trade down from six. Gain more first-rounders. Gain more second-rounders. Whatever you get back from that, gain as many picks as you can because there's needs every single place in the roster. But I, I do agree with keep the offensive line. Try to improve that first so that when the quarterback gets in there, he's not running for his life. You're not scarring this right. guy right away. He has the best situation to succeed. And it could be Dwayne Haskins at six. It could still be yeah. Dwayne Haskins at six, which I think if he's there, I'd, I'd take him at six. Mm-hmm. And then he's a guy I think that does need a really good offensive line. Struggled mightily under pressure. I don't think he handles it all that well. Mm-hmm. Improved a little bit down the stretch last year. Um, but if it is Haskins, you start the rebuild around him. I want to steal Sam's thoughts, though, that I think he tweeted out, too, and we talked about here in the office. If you look at uh, Dave Gettleman's high-end moves over the last two years, he's made a power move for a running back at number two overall, traded for a guard, and traded for a safety and some draft capital. Three of the least valuable positions. (laughs) Safety depends on the role, right? Yes. They're on the lower end of the value Mm -hmm. spectrum traded a top three wide receiver on the high end of the value spect- spectrum, wide receivers, and an edge defender on the high end of the, va- of, of the value spectrum. And forget the fact that you, maybe Olivier Vernon is overpaid and all that stuff. You still, it's, a, it's more of a premium position. So he traded premium positions for non-premium positions, essentially, overall, in his high-end moves. Well, and also, the, I, don't, I would consider this a high-end move, too. He traded a fourth for Alec Ogletree and then decided to pay him $10 million a year. Like a yeah, linebacker. throw that on the list, too. You can throw that on the list because that's... Linebacker. Fourth round is still... That's where you know picks start to drop off in terms of how valuable they are. But fourth rounder can still come in and start right away for your football team. He traded that for a linebacker who probably should not be starting for your football team. Here's what we need to do. We won't do they it here on this podcast. We'll do a separate video. We'll get in the war room, Mike, mm-hmm. and we will rebuild the Giants roster. That's a great. We'll say we've got we've got the sixth pick. We've got the seventeenth pick. Here's who we're here's, mm-hmm. here's who we're targeting. Here's what we'll do in free agency. Here's how we're going to keep our compensatory picks. We'll give a little three year plan. plan. We'll we'll do that. That sounds um, maybe later I would in the love week to. next week. I'd love next, to. In the coming weeks, keep an eye on that, uh, Giants fans. All right, let's move on to the – so we've, we've hit the Browns and the Giants. They're two of the major players here in free mm-hmm. agency. The draft has also been affected in a number of other ways based off some signings. Let's go almost by the draft pick here. Yeah. Uh, the number two overall pick is the San Francisco 49ers. And I, they've been linked to Nick Bosa. If he's there, they want Nick Bosa. They need edge defenders. They just traded for D. Ford, who's mm-hmm. franchised by the Kansas City Chiefs. Do we think that the D. Ford signing has any impact on, you know, a Nick Bosa draft pick? Essentially, if he's there, I think it only could have an impact in terms of they could be sitting at number two and be more receptive to trade offers. Yeah, or trading back. Right. If someone's really coming up, say uh, Cardinals. I mean, say Cardinals drafted Nick Bosa. There you got Josh Allen sitting there at number two. You like Josh Allen, but I already have an edge defender now. Maybe I kick back, draft an, another edge defender, but I get another pick out of it, draft another starter for my team. So that's the only thing I can really see it because you had such a glaring needed edge, no talent there whatsoever. Cassius Mars led them with like 39 pressures a season ago as a full-time starter, which is fairly dreadful. They n- needed someone there. D. Ford is that guy. Would love some insurance with how D. Ford's career has gone so far, but – yeah, I do think that's the only way it impacts them. Nick Bosa, if he's there, still the pick. Yeah, it's we're going to talk about the Jets in a minute too because it's just going to be really tempting if if Kyler goes one and there's these two blue chip defensive players on the board, mm-hmm. Nick Bosa and Quinn and Williams, 
do the 49ers and the Jets have I don't know do, are they are they do they have strong enough convictions in their ability to draft later mm-hmm. to trade down leave those guys on the board who will be coveted by teams you know later in the top 10 are they do they feel good enough about trading down and building the roster because I think both teams could really benefit from it especially the Niners I, with corners I just question so I think we've like gone to this assumption that Kyle Murray's number one overall pick to the Cardinals, which crazy to think that we got in here after you know, know. a month ago. People were wondering if he was even going to play. We'll, we'll see what happens oh, if he does declare. Day. I know, but we'll I'm see saying. how he interacts with so, his teammates at Pro Day first. But I guess under that assumption that the Cardinals have number one pick and draft Kyler Murray, who's trading up though? Is the other thing that I get. like usually get that trade value when someone wants a quarterback and is trading, you know, making a leap for it. Is it the Broncos now? But they traded for Flacco. Uh, obviously, like John Elway. That's not going to but, but com- stop them from, but who's going to trade up and for whom? Dwayne Haskins, is someone really getting that excited about him to go up to two, to three, to four? Is someone going to? I think that's, that's the thing. Is I would love to trade down, but you only really get that value when someone's going up for a QB. I think Bosa and Quinnen are strong enough prospects that teams are going to want to trade up. If you think about like the Bucks, who have been looking for Oh, I know someone will forever. want to. It's more you get the real big pack, the real sweetheart packages when it's QBs. When it's QBs, yeah. I agree. And so... Here's who might. Do the Broncos, despite getting Flacco, are they in love with Dwayne Haskins to the point that they have to get to two to leapfrog the Giants? Because the Giants are the next QB needy team at six. So somebody has to leapfrog the Giants to go get mm-hmm. a Haskins, say, if, yes. if Kyler's off the board. Broncos, Bengals, Dolphins, Redskins, that range. Someone, one of those. If someone, one of those teams love Haskins, those are the teams that will be up there to get them. But it's, again, do, you, do they really love Haskins? A lot of teams seem to be lower you know so yeah, Jaguars got their QB now they're just like the market doesn't seem to be as hot for him as not I mean, or as hot as it was last year yeah. for but, QBs I, but I would Arnold. gladly if I'm the 49ers that roster just it has too many holes to say Nick Bosa is going to turn us around Nick Bosa and D Ford while I do love that combination that would be a great pass rushing duo I'm going to trust myself as a drafting as a GM that if I get three picks back for that, I'll hit on those three as well. Right, especially if you're just trying to load up on corners. You at least have an edge defender. Mm-hmm. Um, you can grab another one maybe to pair with D Ford with those picks. Um, so, yeah, I think trade down still the best option for the 49ers. If they do end up taking Nick Bosa at number two, it's not the worst thing in the world. You pair him with D Ford. You still you get Solomon Thomas on the inside with DeForest Buckner. You know, then yes. that's you a got little an bit interesting better. little third down package with all those guys being able to deploy them. Uh, that would be at number two. I think it's a no brainer. Nick Bosa is there, Tim. And now Quan Alexander they add to? Yep. Can they cut down on those missed tackles? Because he's definitely got the speed for Healthy that system. Healthy missed tackles. Yeah, he does have the speed for that system. Goes him, uh, pairs him with Warner there for an athletic linebacker duo, the type, you know, a modern NFL linebacking core. Paid a lot for it, but uh, they have been bad at linebacker without Ruben Foster there. So that's what happens, yeah. All right, quick break to tell you about our friends over at Eckridge, the official smoked sausage of the college football playoff. Eckridge is the go-to solution for your favorite game day dish. Available in a variety of flavors and forms, Eckridge smoked sausage is versatile enough to be paired with whatever you have on hand so you can create a meal that will satisfy everyone's appetites before focusing on the game. Pick up Eckridge smoked sausage from your local grocer's refrigerated section today. Eckridge will also be offering fans a chance to win $1 million at some of the top college football matchups during the 2019 season. Visit EckridgeFootball.com for more information. All right, Mike, let's move on to the Jets. They're at number three. They've made a lot of moves. They've added a lot of players. Yes, they have. And the narrative I'm seeing, whether or not those players are good, we'll talk about in a sec, that this just kind of locks them into Quinn and Williams. They've added you know, some talent to the defensive side of the ball, that this gives them that chance to get Quinn and Williams, the other blue-chip talent, the interior defensive lineman, that's probably the closest thing we've seen since Aaron Donald. However, I think the debate is, can you can you lose sight of the blue chip player and trade down? Because if, you, if you're in it for the long term, I love the trade down for the Jets. I just, wait, this locks him into Quinn Williams. I think this locks him into Josh Allen, Steve. Really? This, they re-signed Henry Anderson. They have Leonard Williams there on the interior. Quinn, I'm not saying he's redundant. He can play on that front three with them, but edge they, they wanted anthony Maybe Barr so badly yeah. that they were going to overpay him to try to pay to, to just see what he ha- could do as a pass rusher off the edge i think josh allen's going to be too much to pass up there with just they've had that need at edge for over a decade it seems like uh, maybe i'm thinking of this more before the henry anderson signing mm-hmm. recently but we've always looked at this as bosa and quinnon and then you know josh mm-hmm. allen right behind those guys all right so in that I scenario think, yeah is it josh allen 
versus the trade down. Maybe you grab another uh, mid-first edge mm-hmm. and then just continue to add picks because we keep talking about last year, they made a big move to go get Sam Donald. They gave up a ton of draft capital. Now is your chance. You get the opportunity to sit at three, have someone else trade up, potentially. You know, there needs to be a market. Yeah. Trade down and, and accumulate as many picks as possible yeah, to build. Two, two and three, four Niners and Jets, both ideal scenarios. Someone falls in love with the quarterback, tries to go up and get them. That's your ideal scenario. For either of those teams, you have too many needs to say one guy is going to solve all of this. So I do think the way their free agency moves went, running back, linebacker, where they paid big money, slot receiver, those are not – they weren't drafting those high anyway. Right. They weren't going to be – that was, weren't going to be their first-round picks anyway, not necessarily premium position. So I, I do think that – just getting more players, more shots at those premium positions in the first round because there are some good corners. There are some good edge players even after the top five. Right. Get a couple shots at those guys. Yeah, I'm all about um, – I mean, if you if, let's say they could trade down to 12 or 13. I mean, you can get like a Cleveland Farrell and then lo- if you get an extra second rounder in there, grab a couple corners. Yeah. And then, you know, those three players, let's say two second-round corners and say Cleveland Farrell, who's a lesser pass rusher we think than Josh Allen – it, you're weighing those three players, essentially, or two of those players versus just a Josh Allen. Mm-hmm. Cleveland Farrell in a corner versus Josh Allen at four. Yes. I'll take my chances on the two players over the yes, one. exactly. If they are forced to pick at three, are you just taking Quinn and Williams out of the equation now because of Henry Anderson and Leonard Williams? I mean, Leonard Williams could walk in a I, year or Yeah, two, right? I, I don't. You again, I, 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 between Quinn and Williams and Josh Allen, I would rather have Quinn and Williams. He is safer to me. I think he's going to be a better NFL player. And neither of those guys play the same position as Williams could. Williams can play over the nose. So that could be his full time role in your defense. But at the same time, the edge, the edge need. You can't argue with the need and just the way kind of the Jets have been rolling. It's they've been trying to fill needs. The it seems like with your need, the way the they're edge. rolling here. And so Josh Allen need talent. A lot of the stars aligning there. What are your thoughts on the actual re-signings by the Jets, or signings and re-signings by the Jets? Le'Veon Bell, the big money at running back. C.J. Mosley, big money at inside linebacker. Jameson Crowder at slot corner, as you mentioned. Henry Anderson, re, you know, mm, re-upping re-up. on the defensive interior. Of course, we like that. We've always loved Henry, um, but Le'Veon Bell and C.J. Mosley, the big splash signings. It's just they're not premium positions and. Le'Veon Bell obviously took a year off. One running back's not going to change your running game. You need to have the offensive line in front of him to help as well. And then C.J. Mosley, he's just never been more than a solid linebacker. Now, solid linebacking play is great. Darren Lee was very inconsistent over the course of his career. You'd much rather have Mosley than Darren Lee, what we've seen from him in recent years. But at that point, it's still a linebacker. There's only so much impact he can make. And then someone like Mosley, who's not an athletic playmaking linebacker, more just a solid zone coverage linebacker, at that point, you're not really – I don't see the needle moving too much with either of those moves. Yeah, I mean, I think overall the roster has gotten better. The question is by how much and mm-hmm. for all of that money Yes, is is the other question. I mean, they also had a ton of money that they needed to spend that mm-hmm. was just out there. Um, so, yeah, there's but still it, a lot of question marks. Take just those two moves. You, you add Le'Veon Bell, C.J. Mosley to their offense and defense respectively. If you just signed one Trey Flowers for maybe $5 million more than you had to pay Mosley – that's going to make more of an impact to me than either of those guys. Really? Trey Flowers? Just one Trey of, Flowers on the edge is going to impact more plays than those guys instead would. Instead of Mosley or Bell. Yeah. I will say this about Bell. You know, We've always loved his pass game versatility, the ability to play a little bit, you know, split out wide and all that stuff. That should you know, it's pair nice. with it's an, Darnold's It's a good set. addition. It is yeah. a good addition to that offense, especially for Blake, excuse me, <laughs> Sam Darnold, Ooh. where he throws his route, where he, where he was throwing his routes last year. At least. I see why you said Blake Bortles, because we're moving on in our little trusty <laughs> yeah, document here. We're moving on to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, real quick, I mean, they're sitting there at number seven overall. They had Nick Foles. They're going to build around Nick Foles. I thought, uh, I tweeted out, well, let me get your thoughts initially, and I'll, I'll get to my tweet, which I thought was um, mm-hmm. from a couple days ago, which I thought, you know, some things up pretty well with the Nick Foles era the last couple of years with the Eagles. What are your thoughts on Foles and the Jags? Well, so I thought they still could draft quarterback at seven overall until I saw they paid him $22 million. And then I said to myself, that's starter money. Right. Which is <laughs> why they gave him $22 million apparently instead of For offering him $18 million because they, they want him to be the end question starter in the locker room. So they didn't lowball him. That was the big question. Who are they bidding against? But exactly. They weren't bidding against anybody but themselves offered straight away in the $20 million range to him apparently. I, I'm not going to say it's a bad move because this, their hands were tied. They put themselves in a position where this was their only move with a roster that 
is only built to win now. They don't have a lot of – this isn't a long-term built roster in terms of the free agents they have paying big money to in the next couple seasons. And so if you're drafting a quarterback hoping he's going to lead you to a Super Bowl year one, the chances are that's not going to happen. Year two, it could happen, but the roster is still – again, it's an aging roster. Nick Foles was your only option after you committed to Blake Bortles, and that didn't work out. So we'll just see how it goes. At this point, I'm not going to criticize it. We'll just see how it goes. So they're drafting DK Metcalf at seven. Yes, is what – 95% chance if he's there. <laughs> that's, I'll see it. I'd guess they're drafting DK Metcalf. That's our take. DK Metcalf and then another receiver in the second round. I mean, they, because yeah. they, they're going to go into the draft, I think, saying, okay, we're, we're doing pretty well on defense. We lost Malik Jackson, but we drafted Taven Bryan last year to kind of replace him. Mm-hmm. You still have Jalen Ramsey, A.J. Boye, corner, corner. You still have good linebackers. You have Calais Campbell. So they're going to look at their defense and say, okay, we're, set. we're good. We're two years removed from having the, mm-hmm. one of the best defenses in the league. And they're going to look at the offense and say, okay, we've got Nick Foles. We've got questions at playmaker. We could still – the offensive line's not bad. It's okay. Mm-hmm. But it's going to be playmakers. Yeah. It has to be, right? The only only other player I could see being the pick at seven, Jawan Taylor. They released Jeremy Parnell. They could, oh, that's right. They could right. slot yeah. in at right tackle right away. Right. Only really other player I could see. So one of those two but probably, is your, probably is what you're going to get, Jags fans. But it's offensive players. And I'll tell you what, if we're talking – we should do a video on building the Jags too – um, if they don't go, or whether or not they do go DK Metcalf, I still come back to this whole second and third round. It's a deep tight end class. Yes. It's a deep wide receiver class. You could get an Akeem Butler maybe top end of the second. You can get a Caleb Wilson at tight end maybe in the third for you mm-hmm. from UCLA. And all of a sudden, okay, we've got two guys we nice. might be able to plug right in as playmakers. We could see them go Jawan Taylor at tackle, Hakeem Butler at wide receiver, and Caleb Wilson at tight end. And all of a sudden, okay, that's, those are three intriguing parts to yeah. the offense for the Jaguars. Because at this point, Marquise Lee, D.D. Westbrook, nothing at tight end. I mean, they, they yeah. really don't have anybody there. So that's not the start of a yeah, good D.D.'s offense. a you know, supplemental, exactly. complementary so piece at wide is, receiver. They need someone. So it's going to be someone there. So D.K. Metcalf or Jawan Taylor at seven. Yeah. All right, um, Matt, we can maybe get my Nick Foles tweet. Like the, the, I'll get the image for you. We'll get it up here. Um, on the video, but Nick, Fo- the best games graded by the Eagles, uh, by Eagles quarterbacks over the last two years. This just sums up the Nick Foles era of the last two years, right? The top two grades are by Nick Foles, mm. NFC Championship That's and the cool. Super Bowl, 92.9 and 90.7. The next seven games are from Carson Wentz, and then the next three are from Carson, uh, from Nick Foles, and then the next five from Carson Wentz. I mean, it's essentially. Nick Foles has the best two, and then and Carson yeah. Wentz has been the better quarterback. Yes. But the worst graded games by the Eagles quarterbacks over the last two years, four out of the worst five have been Foles, mm-hmm. and six out of the worst ten have been Foles. That's, a, that's oversampling, we say in the analytics community. Oversampling? I mean, he, yeah. he's been oversampling. I mean, yeah. it's statistically relevant. Yeah. It's, so here's the thing. Um, we've we've joked that Foles is is very Flacco ish. Um, I do still think if you put him, you give him a full season opportunity, he's a seventy three overall, seventy five, seventy type of quarterback in PFF terms, zero to one hundred. That ends up being a top twenty yeah. quarterback, Around which is, 20, yeah. um, I think you're just kind of banking on the volatility to come at the right time. Yes, with Nick Foles, I think that's just where we are. And to be fair. In his credit, he wasn't losing games for the Eagles. He had bad games. He wasn't throwing away games. Blake Boris was throwing away games. Oh, yeah. Look, full he's not, he wasn't. He was actually, over the last two seasons, one of the safer in terms of turnover where he plays right. at the quarterback position. He had one of the lower marks in the NFL. What that offense needs. He has a history of taking care of the ball pretty well. Even in you know 2013 when he had those two interceptions, it wasn't like he was – he had a little bit of interception luck. That was extreme, but that mm-hmm. um, he was pretty good at taking care of the ball. Um, I'm fascinated on just having more Nick Foles data points. We've we've seen him yeah, right. in 2013 in the Chip Kelly offense when the league had no idea what to do with it, mm-hmm. where he was not nearly as good as the crazy stats that he put up. 2014, he regressed. 2015, he started for the Rams, almost wanted to retire, uh, and then incredible. comes back. And he when he did take over the Eagles in 2017, he had some ugly games, and then he had the ridiculous playoff run. Yep. So I just I you know a full season of play in a mid-tier yeah. offense by the Jags. I want to see what we have here in Nick exactly. Foles. Exactly. I do too. So that's just where I am with him and the Jags. There's a lot of time on the Jaguars, but they deserve it. What else we have here, Mike? The Oakland Raiders? Oakland Raiders. Definitely this will wrap worth it up for us. touching on. No, there's more. Oh, there's more. You did. Did you delete stuff? No. Oh, it's under. It's oh, under. you moved my read. I didn't that's move That's what you read. did. Someone moved the read, not me. Man, we got a lot more to get through. This is going to be a three-hour podcast. We'll just zoom. 
through some of these. All right, Oakland Raiders. Antonio Brown and Trent Brown. Trent and Brown, Joyner. LaMarcus Joyner. They went from the Giants' gut to the complete rebuild overnight, basically, or in the course of one year. They did the Browns' rebuild in one year. I worry about them going a little quickly here because you're – still have a roster that there's a reason they went 4-12 and 12 last year. Right. They had a terrible offense. They had a terrible defense. You know, There's a reason they're this bad. They needed pretty much every position on the roster needed help, and they only they go out and put big money into three different positions, whereas I think putting average money or picks into a handful, into spreading that wealth out so you're not a super thin roster, one of these guys goes down, all of a sudden you're back to square one to being a incredibly thin at those positions i think they just needed more than this i'm not sure it's ready to flip them back around overnight All right, i mean we saw we saw the offense with the number one receiver they had amari cooper it was still a bad offense so well let's right, watch this best case scenario here watch this mm-hmm. right if you look at antonio brown receiver trent brown left tackle lamarcus joiner safety all right those are they're covered they're joiner's a coverage player brown's a left tackle and brown is a wide receiver right mm-hmm. brown and brown um, so those are at least pass game positions. If we're talking about Josh Allen maybe going at three to the Jets, that might mean Quinn and Williams is there for the Raiders. So now you add Quinn into that D-line, and you take your late two first-round picks, and based off of what NFL boards are compared to ours, we th- there might be a DeAndre Baker or Byron Murphy available there. Mm-hmm. Stock up on corners late first. What if you get two corners and Quinn and Williams with your three first-round picks? Oh, wait, uh, they're a lot. Yeah. Three. Yeah, I mean, it would be very good. And then they have one at the top of the second. You could – transform this roster overnight but again you have to hit on a lot of those picks like that's yeah. as assuming you're hitting on all of these picks and you just go through their roster you look at their wide receivers after antonio brown jordy nelson your number two at almost 35 years old marcel aitman they need a number two there, more basically. playmakers there the offensive line calicio assembly gone you need a guard there someone to fill in you have now colton miller on the right side there's no just telling if he's going to succeed there because he obviously has struggled on the left side, flipping him to the opposite side, pessimistic not now. doing any favors there. Tight end, Jared Cook's gone. You have Lee Smith in there. You need a tight end. He's basically a tackle. Maybe edge, he play right you still tackle. don't have an edge. Arden Key was a mid-rounder last year. Hopes there's some potential there, but still need an edge. Not a single caliber NFL starting linebacker on the roster at the moment. They got safety, but only gearing Connolly at corner. You need multiple corners. Like There's just a lot of needs still. This is It looks great. I mean, they added talent. But you still have a roster that's deeply. So it's it's deeply still flawed. a long rebuild, and yes. they put a lot of money into Antonio right now, and Trent Brown, word. yes, and Lamarcus Joyner. All right, that's fair. All right, let's move on to the Buffalo Bills. They're picking at number nine, and they've made a lot of moves as well. Um, some I think we like, some we don't. Let's discuss the two receivers first: John Brown, speed outside receiver; Cole Beasley, the slot receiver. They've also added Tyler Croft, the backup tight end. I mean, he's a, he's a backup tight end, yeah. right? He's I mean, a number he's two tight yeah, end. Yeah, he was has never been anything more. 400 yards in his best season as a starter with the Bengals. When the year he did start, Tyler Eifert out that year, he's just not a he's not a receiving threat. He's just not great. He's, he's a, a number more of a two blocking tight end yeah. type of tight end. Ty Insecki, a guy that we really like that yes. most people haven't heard of. He's essentially been he, a swing tackle his entire career and played well when he's given a he chance. He steps in as probably their best offensive lineman from day one. At I the would moment. start him at right tackle. Starting him at right tackle for sure. Uh, Frank Gore. The ageless wonder at running back. And then Kevin Johnson made pretty big money Mm -hmm. at cornerback. I think there's some stuff. What what do we like out of this bunch here with the Bills? So it was always going to be tough because obvious all their needs were offensive. Pretty much all their needs were offensively. Some needs on the defense side of the ball, but all the holes they had to plug were offensively. And this was the one of the weakest offensive skill position classes in recent memory, probably actually since I've been doing this, the weakest I've seen in terms of talent at receiver. Running back, tight end, that sort of thing. So John Brown to get him for three years, twenty-seven million. It's probably the best skill position contract I've seen yet. He's still a very good deep threat. Still, compared to the obviously deep threats on the roster, it's night and day in terms of the talent he brings to the table. So that's what Josh Allen throws. That's where that's the area where if you could say excels at is throwing the ball down the field. So that meshes well. Uh, Ty and Secchi, like we said, you got a starting caliber tackle yeah, for $7 like million, dollars, just over $7 million a year. That was one of our favorite contracts. Obviously, he's old, not going to be a long-term solution, but Josh Allen needs the protection. So they did the best they could with a weak offensive free agent class, but he had so much money, you could have could have ripped the handle off that defense and made this unquestionably the best defense in the NFL with some of that money and then go and try to build your offense through the draft or something of that nature. I just think that money, some of these contracts offensively, 
spe- the Croft one especially and the Beasley, right. I just don't think they're going to move the needle. I, I don't see Josh Allen needing a slot weapon in that offense. I don't see that being where he excels. I don't think he'll I be a high-volume slot thrower. Yeah, put that put that $16 million a year or whatever you're paying those to, something in that area, get you another defensive lineman, and all of a sudden your defense is – I think that could have been a better use of funds. Yeah, I mean, I think – We've always said Josh Allen's best routes are seam routes, you know, the stuff that he could throw down the field. I would want more of a vertical slot weapon. Yes. Beasley can get open pretty well from the slot, but that's not where Allen's I mean, Allen's inaccurate yeah. in, in general, right? So he's, it, that's, that's the question mark there. Uh, Kevin Johnson had a question on the defensive side. I've been telling... It was, nothing. It was a nothing move. I mean, I'm not sure he even makes the roster there. I've, well, I've been pounding the table for them grabbing Byron Murphy at nine. I would still... Mm-hmm. Look at that, just because I think his fit is great. But I do think now the Bills are going to draft DK Metcalf, right? The Jaguars don't at seven. Yeah, that is, the so Bills are going to draft DK Metcalf. Metcalf will make it out of the top ten if the Jaguars do pass. I don't see how they could not. Just with that, the roster, the way it's built. Now you have some talent at wide receiver, but you don't have big, physical, someone contested catch, someone with some athleticism. That's DK Metcalf. I mean, DK Metcalf just the skill set p- pairs so well with what Josh Allen does. You have Metcalf and Brown as deep threats. A guy like Zay Jones would be, be more of a possession guy. That'd be a fun offense. Be DK yeah. Metcalf and John Brown on opposite sides and just, How about just play Allen, action deep every snap. I mean, Allen throwing to Metcalf. Just let it rip. The vol- like Every time he throws it accurately, it gets dropped. Every time Metcalf's open, it gets overthrown. Mm. It would just be beautiful. <laughs> I mean, I, look, you've got to build around Josh Allen as much as you can and give him help and at least, I mean, they're taking steps in the right direction. Yeah. In Buffalo, we're so we're so mean to Josh Allen, but he was uh, no. I think he was okay. If they one. do get DK, Met, that would be the ideal pick. No, I think that'd them. be a great that is, great pairing with Josh. You need the offense just ha- for him to succeed. His past success is a downfield passing offense. It is yeah. a high it is a high play action, high downfield. Utilize his legs to get draw safeties up that sort of thing. Draw linebackers up and then attack deep because that if there's one area where he is at an NFL caliber in terms of throwing, it is down the field. Let's talk about the Green Bay Packers. They are sitting there now with the number 12 and 30 picks, Mm -hmm. and they actually did stuff in March, Mike. It was an incredible day as someone who uh, was born in Milwaukee and is a Packers fan. It was something I've never seen in my lifetime. I'll just say it was incredible to watch all day Tuesday. in Green Bay. Four guys, big contracts, all of them. Plugging needs. They finally plugged needs in free agency. Adrian Amos at safety, Preston Smith, Preston Smith, Zedari Smith at the edge, Billy Turner at guard. Love some of those more than others, well, but they got they got themselves in a position where at pick number twelve, at pick number thirty, it's BPA. Best player, the best player they see on their board, they can go out and get because their roster, they finally put themselves in a position where it's not glaring weakness that's gonna hamper our season. And they're a team we we love essentially the way they've drafted in recent years, which is the high volume picks at corner, mm-hmm. finding what you know what they can in, in, as far as coverage goes, and then you know they lose you know they they're essentially replacing Nick Perry and Clay Matthews as yes. edge rushers with Preston and Zadarius Smith. Even though they wanted to move on from Nick Perry and Clay Matthews, who have not been great over the last couple of years, mm-hmm. is this a massive upgrade though with Preston and Zadarius? That's my question. Yes, because they were that bad. I'm not saying this doesn't give them one of the best pass rushes in the NFL. I love Kenny Clark and Mike Daniels on the interior. It's just, it's just, it gives them a solid pass rush, though. It doesn't give them, it doesn't put them in the upper echelon by any means, but it puts them in a very solid territory where they were dreadful last year. It was hampering their defense, how bad they were pressuring the passer a season ago. So I think this at least puts them in the good range, which with what they have in terms of young talent in that secondary could be more than enough. So they've got those two guys, Adrian Amos. Um, a lot of debate about Adrian Amos. We have, yes. first off, Bears fans seem to hate us in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and the best part about when fans hate us, Eagles fans did this to a, co- uh, do this a couple years ago. It's not about when you say players on their team aren't good. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you tell them that good players, or you tell them that players are good, and they're like, no, he's bad. So we've been saying Adrian Amos is a pretty good player the last couple of years. Yep. Bears fans can't stand that for some reason. <laughs> like we, Eagles fans were so mad when we said they had a good offensive line in 2017, the best yeah. offensive line, right? Which it was, and yeah. they won the Super Bowl. We were, uh, and we were saying the Bears were one of the best defenses in the NFL back in 2017. Before at the beginning of 2017, right. before everyone was even all over him. Even you were questioning that. You're like, yes. I don't know, but but Adrian Amos was a big part because, of that. Yeah, because Adrian Amos was that good. He's um he's not as flashy of a playmaker as an Eddie Jackson, but he's one of those. Devin McCourty type of safeties that yes. just doesn't make a ton of mistakes. 
and show plays me him safety. Show me his negative plays. Like show me the bad plays. I, a lot of times, a lot of people fall in love with the safety because oh, you can see the highlight plays. You don't see, you don't notice the negatives, the bad plays as much. You don't see him being in the right position over the top of a route as much as you notice a guy jumping a slant route and taking it to the house. Yeah, exactly. So, so Eddie Jackson made all the flash plays last year. He graded as such. We had him, yeah. you know, as our top coverage player. But for multiple years now, Adrian Amos has been a pretty safe player on the back end, which is extremely valuable in today's NFL. Well, and I mean, you watched the Packers at all last year. That's unbelievably valuable. They just yes. busted coverages left and right with those safeties. They were abysmal in terms of just assignments. So just having a guy who can execute that is a huge improvement for them. So when we add this all up, we're looking at the Packers potentially adding Adrian Amos, Preston Smith, Zedaria Smith to their defense. Billy Turner on offense, not great. But they are added some guys plus – the two first round draft picks. We'll this say, could be a pretty impactful offseason. It very much could be. Billy Turner, I will say, career year last year was the best year of his career. Yeah, he wasn't bad. Did turn it around uh, to some degree and has positional flexibility. Played a bunch of different positions for the Broncos, played right tackle and guard. And there's no question, he's an upgrade from Byron Bell. So uh, if you're upgrading, they paid a little bit of a premium to upgrade, but there's a chance he's. Talk your way through it, Mike. I know. It's cool. It's good. All right, let's wrap this up. Yep. Philadelphia Eagles, another team that's making a ton of moves. They've added Malik Jackson on the defensive line and Deshaun Jackson, mm -hmm. a wide receiver. The Jacksons. They just added. find money. They're just, I don't know where, but they find By it. By trading Michael yeah. Bennett. Trading Michael Bennett. Jordan Hicks is out, and uh, Ronald Darby's still out there. They're uh, yeah. one of their corners from last year. Um, the Eagles seem to be doing a pretty good job of just. Here's what's been tough they won a Super Bowl in 2017, they were strong in some important areas. It's almost like they're doing everything they can the last couple of years from, you know, Vinnie Curry moves and all these different things to just replace what they've had, replace mm -hmm. what they had the previous year. Yeah, keep strength to strength. And that's what Malik Jackson really is on that defensive line. How do you replace some of Michael Bennett's production? You grab a Malik Jackson. Yeah, the thing I love, though, is compensatory pick-wise, they're going to get two with Jordan Hicks leaving, Ronald Darby leaving. Malik Jackson was a cut by the Jaguars, right. so he doesn't factor in the equation. Deshaun Jackson was a trade with the Bucks, doesn't factor in the equation. That could be a three and a four. Maybe even two threes, depending on, I don't know, the Hicks contract. Not huge, so maybe a three and a four, but Darby's definitely going to get a three for you. So that's that's team building. That's foresight. That is how you kings stay kings, as they say. Uh, it's a good offseason for the Eagles. Now just obviously Carson Wentz needs to stay healthy, and you still need to hit on some corners in the draft. Yeah, the corner position is, is the big question mark, I think, for the Eagles because uh, it looked like a strength a couple of years ago. Now mm -hmm. Darby's out. They had so many injuries last year. And maybe not the development of a Sidney Jones that you were hoping to see, that type of thing. Yeah, 25th pick, ways they could go with that. I could see offensive tackle to someone in the pipe for Jason Peters behind him. One year he's back for one yeah, year. Yeah, one deal. year back. Yeah. I mean, he's just at his age. That's not even, he might not even make it through the season. Cornerback as well, obvious need. Linebacker, I could see them going to if someone really is there that they fall in love with, but cornerback. I'd, I'd Darby walks pencil one in there. Let's discuss their offense really quickly because mm -hmm. when you have Alshon Jeffrey with the big contested catch guy, Nelson Aguilar in the slot, and now Deshaun Jackson mm -hmm. as a deep threat, plus those two tight ends, Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard, there are mismatch yeah. possibilities, possibilities everywhere. This is like my favorite way to build an offense. That is five pretty distinct skill sets there with those five skill position players. Yeah, it is a... Diverse offense, a lot of different things you can do. Would love to see them add in the mid rounds, three, four, running back with some receiving ability. Someone like Rodney Anderson out of Oklahoma, just someone who has can catch the ball out of the backfield because I think that could just take you to the next level in terms of offensively. Yeah. They, I, we will as for as much as we hammer running backs don't matter, whatever. You can be bad at the position. A lot of guys are good, but you can also be bad, and I think they were bad at that position last year. Well, yeah, but I also think like when. Like, if the Jets had all of these receivers, say the Eagles added Le'Veon Bell mm -hmm. to this mix, mm -hmm. it, for money aside, you'd say, oh my, how do you cover that? Yeah. How do you cover all of these tight ends and receivers and a Le'Veon Bell? With, when you have Le'Veon Bell with the Jets, it's like, all right, he's the, f he's the guy that may be tough to cover, but like, mm -hmm. who else, you know, we need receivers first. You need tight ends first. Yeah. With the Eagles, now, if you add a guy, you know, you have a running back with receiving ability, that just adds to the difficulty of trying to cover this team. They're really building a good group around Carson Wentz. Well, it's one of those things like uh, you're the Eagles. You have these downfield options. They're so good. You're, I guess it's like the Chiefs last year when you had Kareem Hunt in that lineup. All these downfield options are so good. But when oh, when he has to check down, you go to Kareem Hunt, and it can still go. Yeah, get he's you making a first a guy down. Miss it can still get you a yeah. first down. But you juxtapose that with the Giants last year where it's 
you're checking down all the time. It's not a great option to be right. checking down, but the fact that he can, when you have all these weapons on field, they can kill you, and then you check down, and oh, he can also get you the first down. If you're ch- if you're throwing it to him every single time, that's not great. But if he's just that last piece of the puzzle, yes, it is very impactful. Yeah, I think there's something to it. By the way, Deshaun Jackson, as we we did our Deshaun Jackson video here on the YouTube channel, se- over 17 yards per reception in his career. Yeah, I that mean, is a career year for most guys. He that's is his career average. Consistently top five deep threat in the NFL. And you're still year. doing it last year. And with all the 12 personnel, the two tight end sets that the Eagles run, mm-hmm. he only has he can be a part of the two tight end sets. 30, 35 snaps per game, let him do that distinctly, and then, you know, spread, you know, move move guys around with Aguilar and everything. I mean, I just think there's so much that the Eagles can do now. I love yep. I love that move with Deshaun Jackson coming back to Philly for almost nothing. Mm-hmm. That's the other thing, too. All right, let's wrap up the pod, Mike. A little My Guys section. I mean, I, I knew who you were going to talk about this week because you were just raving about him in the office all week. He has been... One of my favorite players to watch. I cannot believe I have not heard more about him this draft season. It's David Long, the Michigan cornerback. If this guy was an inch taller and had an inch longer arms, I think he'd be in that conversation with DeAndre Baker, Byron Murphy, Greedy Williams for first cornerback off the board. That's how talented I think he is. Should we just put him in that conversation anyway? Or do you think the size could be detrimental? He's at the point where 5'10", sub 31-inch arms, I think with his skill set, the way he plays – Press man coverage is his go-to right now. Obviously, in Michigan, they don't play really anything other than press man coverage. I do worry about that being somewhat of an issue. I don't see it, foresee him ever being a complete lockdown at that, but the movement skills, the change of direction ability off the charts, he sticks with guys on routes. A lot of cornerbacks will have to, in college, you'll see, grab guys down the field on in-breaking routes, posts, digs, to stick with them on those routes. I don't. Long's not grabbing these guys, and he's sticking with them when they break on the routes. He's that quick with his feet the best feet in this class that i've seen had went to the combine 6.45 three cone the best three cone and the best short shuttle of anyone there the moving skills are off the charts i hate that i didn't get to see him more in zone coverage that i didn't get to see him more in off coverage because i think that's a a skill that's very valuable in the nfl you're going to be playing a lot of that in the nfl you have to be able to do that so i don't know what his eyes look like in those sort of coverages how he can transition in zones because they really when they were playing zone it was cover two uh, there at michigan so I have question marks about that. That's why I'm pushing him down my board a little bit. But, man, the ability there to stick with wide receivers is second to none in this class. I like it. David Long, guy that we have to look at in the first-round range, I think. Yeah. Given how much we've been hammering cornerback value plus his skill set. Yeah, I threw him in that late first-round range for us that has Amani Oruare, Penn State corner. Guys who have serious question marks that I worry about some translation in the NFL, but the talent you can – definitely see on tape. Amani Orari and Justin Lane are the other two in that range where I'm like, once it gets to the back end of the first round and you kind of picked over the guys who are studs, who are really doing it, you can hope you can fix those guys at that point because they're all fantastic athletes, all three of them. And each, every way we slice the data, I've been looking at it a lot over the last two or three years to get a you know bigger sample. David Long near the top in our grading. Yeah, I mean, He's he gave about nine catches last year. Yeah, 30% completion rate into his coverage over the last two years. And it's a lot of those are overthrows and drops. I mean, those are in there. I mean, we they, track yeah. those. But he's forced the most incompletions as well mm-hmm. at the catch point um, in the draft class yeah, his over the last good, two years. Good ball skills down the field as well. Very much good ball tracking. Are you ready for my guy? Give it to me, Steve. Another Wait. Big Ten cornerback, Justin <laughs> Lane from Michigan State. I thought this week was going to be Ju- Juwan Taylor, you said. Oh, or Juwan Taylor. No, I've got a real my guy, but it's, um, the, it's – Is this cheating? He's the number one player on our draft board, Kyler Murray. Um, but I had, I, I had to rewatch him again this weekend to just uh, continue to get a feel for his game, and I'm just further in on Kyler Murray Mm -hmm. as the guy. Uh, I think when you watch him, there are some question marks. I'm just looking through my notes here. Um, Sometimes he's a tick late on some of his passes. He'll have a little extra hitch. He's had a few rough attempts trying to get the ball up and over underneath defenders. I think those are some uh, concerns with him, Mm -hmm. but he has a quick enough release, the tight arm. I think his dynamic athleticism, is just such an asset. There's so many yeah. plays. With th- this is what separates him from everybody else in the class. So many plays. I know Oklahoma, he's got clean pockets most of the time, but it's not like he never faces quick pressure. When he faces quick pressure, it's like, boom, slips, and he's out. He's slippery, out of the pocket, and you can't get him. I, I think that's the part, to me, that has gotten not talked about enough in terms of the Kyler Murray yeah. evaluation, is the fact that he is 
above Patrick Mahomes' level in terms of pocket escape ability. Right. He is at Lamar Jackson level in terms of rushing ability. Like, he is special as an athlete. Everyone's just like, oh, he's a running quarterback. No, he's not just a running quarterback. He is at another level in terms of his running ability. He's an escape artist yes. from the pocket. And uh, here's what I said. You know, you want guys that keep their eyes up. Mm-hmm. He drops his eyes. This is a little Russell Wilson to him. Again, we're just going to throw every comp yeah. out there. He'll drop his eyes in the pocket to navigate it. But once he gets out of the pocket, he's looking to make a play. He's like Mahomes in that aspect where he's trying to make a play outside the pocket, and he's comfortable doing it. We've talked about a guy like Marcus Mariota is extremely athletic. He is so bad outside the pocket. He has bad outside the pocket instincts. And to be honest, I think that's what separated Mariota though. Getting outside the pocket, yeah, even getting outside. So and he takes and he takes a million sacks. That is what has separated Mariota from other quarterbacks and why he's never taken that next step. He's pretty good in the pocket Mm -hmm. and making the throws that are there. But Mariota, for that athleticism, is just bad outside of structure. Mari like, is special the same way Russell Wilson's special. Yeah, it's it's like comparing Ryan Tannehill with Carson Wentz. They're both testing-wise. They probably both test the same level of athleticism. Carson Wentz has the sort of escapability, that innate, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, just that ability. athleticism. Tannehill is just like lost when something like that breaks down. He yeah. has the arm, but he's just lost when things that sort of happens. And so that's such a big trait to have because I'm not sure there's much teaching that you can do for a guy to give him that. And, and honestly, this is, this is, I think, what separates a lot of quarterbacks. I think Andy Dalton, I think Ryan Tannehill, Sam Bradford, those are guys, if you put them in a clean pocket, hitting open throws, they're pretty good at it. Mm-hmm. It's when they have to do something outside of structure, something that takes instincts or, or even pocket, just moving in the pocket, pocket navigation yeah, and yeah. instincts. They, that is what has kept those guys in the 15 to 25 range mm-hmm. as far as QB rankings go, say, in a given year. And honestly, that's my concern with a Dwayne Haskins. It's my concern with a Josh Rosen. I don't think those guys are there. Yeah. What has separated, I think, Kyler Murray, Baker Mayfield, and maybe a Sam Darnold last year, I think those guys have a little bit more of that ability but Kyler I feel like a lot of what we've been trying to reinforce with people is he makes NFL throws at a high level he throws catchable passes beyond the sticks at a high level not as high as Baker Mayfield but very mm-hmm. high but also when things are bad he, he can make stuff happen he's got good instincts and he can um, he can do some good stuff um, he's not perfect he's missed he missed some easy throws here and there to the flat I mean he does some things he missed the Marquise Brown on the field too. If you watch Marquise Brown tape, he's he missed. Yeah, yeah. He'll miss. He'll he's missed some throws. Um, and I hate using just direct comp- comparisons, but um, Russell Wilson has games where he's just off and he's bad, but he's special enough as an athlete to kind of make up for it outside the pocket to make up for mm-hmm. it. And over time in the pocket, Russell Wilson is way more good than bad. I think you'll get some of that from from Kyler Murray. So I, overall, it's going to be way more good than bad. You're saying he's Russell Wilson. He's, he's exactly player. Russell Wilson. He is Russell Wilson. He is the there guy. There you go. There you have it. Um, here's my last note about this whole thing. Kay. Defenses are in a bind. They must decide whether or not they want to rush him. There's, there's a Ru- Russell Wilson, Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers. Those are guys where defenses need to choose whether they want to keep him in the pocket or take some chances, get some pressure on him, and take the chance that he's going to escape. And all of those guys are capable of winning both inside and outside the pocket. Mm-hmm. That Rodgers, Mahomes, or Russell Wilson. Deshaun Watson, right? You have to choose how you want to handle those guys, and Kyler's in that group. Yeah, people, I've heard the knock on Kyler Murray, oh, you're going to have to give more deep drops. You're going to have to play my shotgun, which whatever, I mean, the shotgun in the NFL today, that's most of your snaps. Anyway, you're going to have to play him on the shotgun. You're going to have to have deep drops so he can see over his offensive line. That's going to lead to more set. It's going to give the edge rushers an advantage. I don't think it will. You, like Because what you just mentioned, a lot of teams are going to decide, hey, we don't want to even give them the chance of breaking the pocket. We're not going to give – You know, we're not going to rush all out on the edges. We're not going to fire off the line of scrimmage because that's how he gets out and gets a big play on us. So I don't think that actually is going to be the case in terms of he's going to force, see more pressure, going to put more stress on his offensive line. It actually might be the opposite. Yeah, I completely agree. He's also – my last note on him. He's very good throwing away from man coverage. This was something uh, – Baker Mayfield has a feel for it. I thought Jared Goff had a great feel for it. You, when there is a tight window, some quarterbacks just have a great feel for where to put it. Mm-hmm. And they have the arm talents to put it where they want, up and away from coverage. Kyler, I thought, did a really, really good job of that overall. So I think that's why that's also accuracy when the Mike Leach thing, oh, I give me the guy who is playing shortstop in you know fourth grade or whatever as the accurate quarterback – some of it is mental. I think it's why it's not you can have great mechanics. It's can you replicate? Can your eye see where that? Oh, yeah. It's can, the you, vision can you process where it's going to be, where that guy's going to be running at this speed at this time? 
that is a mental thing. It doesn't have really much to do with, there is obviously the physical, can you put it accurately, but it's a lot of it is mental as well. Yeah. From my pitching days, I saw a lot of position players, mm -hmm. outfielders and shortstops become pitchers. And my advice to them, these are like teammates and stuff. I was like, don't try to look like a pitcher. Just yeah. be athletic and throw like you did because a shortstop will just kind of turn and throw and they put it on throw the, the ball 90 plus yeah. off balance. And it's like, all right, don't try to just look mechanically sound to pitch. So something to that with Kyler Murray's game. So that's my guy this week. Kyler Murray, the number one player on our draft board. Lock it in. He's our number one player. That's it. There's no more discussion. We used to discuss him versus Bosa versus Quinnen. It's locked in. It's over. From now until the draft. Good work, Mike. That was a good one. Good I extracted over an hour out of you, which is amazing. That's Damn. like it's tough to do. We talked about a lot. I'll of take stuff. the rest of the afternoon off. Yeah, why don't you just go take next week off? Why don't you do that? Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, that was your bonus podcast. A little bit of free agency and draft. I'll be back later in the week with Sam Monson. We'll recap all of the free agent craziness, and you'll get Sam's hot takes in there as well. So everybody, get to ProFootballFocus.com. Continuing all of our free agent coverage, and be sure to get PFF Elite. The only way to see just how good or badly your team did here during free agency. We'll talk to you guys later in the week.